Hello, good evening, and uh, and welcome to uh, our bookshop in uh, in Tring. Um, it's an honour to be hosting this uh, rather lovely little event. We have um, Will, uh, a Tring resident. Um, it's not often we we host a Tring author, and uh, and Dan, who um, we even allow people from Berkhamsted to talk to us. So uh, there you go. There's a there's a thing. Who who thought we couldn't have um, friendship across across the divide? But uh, it's uh, it's an absolute honour to have you, and welcome to the audience who, uh, who who have joined us, and indeed welcome to anyone who's watching it on YouTube. Um, so I'm going to leave you shortly. The first thing I will like to say is please use the Q and A to submit your questions. Um, the Q and A button can be found along the bottom, and uh, um, whatever questions come back. And if if, if indeed you want to use the chat function as well, just to sort of say hello to uh, to Will and congratulate him on the publishing of his book. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to hand over to Dan Parry. Ben, thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Will, uh, brilliant to be with you here this evening. Um, you are, of course, uh, established a TV producer over several years and uh, a published author as well now. And, um, uh, but I must declare an interest. Uh, we have uh, met a few times and uh, we have indeed. <laughs> over the years, and we've talked about uh, war trials and the ongoing project and um, uh, and the labour of love that it's been for you and it's been um, a, a, an important journey I, I would say in your life just just take us back to the beginning about how you first came across the story and, and what really motivated you to pursue it yeah absolutely I've been working on war trials for over five years and it came about when I was developing a documentary for a, a, a company in, in London. And that project was going to be looking at the area of the rules of war and uh, the, the things that, that govern soldiers when they're out on the battlefield. Um, at the time, back in 2016, there'd been uh, a, a lot of controversial cases coming out and soldiers being investigated, there were a lot of questions about that so it it seemed a very ripe topic to be looked at as a tv documentary and among the uh, the people that i spoke to was uh, was was joe mccleary and uh, while the documentary didn't um, didn't get off the ground uh, for a variety of reasons the uh, the, the story uh, and and the conversations i'd had with with joe uh, they stayed with me and about a year or so later I, I got back in touch with him and, and said you know I really want to do something with your story can we can we meet up again and this was summer of 2017 and that was that was the genesis of uh, Joe and I uh, sitting down over numerous occasions and, and what became the book. And it's not an easy subject to get into and it's quite deceptive I mean on the one hand you have three soldiers on the ground, uh, a fourth soldier in the warrior vehicle just up the road, and then four Iraqis uh, in, in the canal. And, um, and then there's the incident that we'll come on to in a moment. Um, so, and that's pretty much the, the groundwork, but, but actually it's a, it's a fantastically complex subject, you know, dealing with sensitive um, issues of uh, justice and, and the law, but also PTSD, and, um, and, and, and plenty of difficulties and challenges and personalities along the way. Uh, how do you go about structuring all, all of this information and, and putting a book like this together? Well, I was taken with the, the whole idea of war trauma, first of all, and as you said, some of those, those contentious issues. And I wanted to approach it in, in a way that made it feel intimate and relatable to, to the reader. And there's, there's a lot of great military books out there, but um, one, one feeling that I had with quite a lot of books that were out there was they, they feel very, very distant from the, uh, uh, the soldiers. They, they talk about, you know, companies of men, uh, large groups of people, whereas I really wanted to, to kind of connect with Joe and, and relate his experiences. So that was first and foremost in, in my mind. So I wanted to kind of structure it through his, his experiences, um, 
that led up to the incident at the uh, at the canal in Iraq, but then also the impact of those those events. So I basically, told essentially two parallel stories: his life and him fighting in Iraq up to that point, and then the the consequences of that. So it, it's basically the the, the battle uh, in Iraq and the battle that he fights when he returns home with, with PTSD. And, and tell me a bit about the mechanics of it. Um, you obviously developed a long-standing relationship with Joe and Clary. You, uh, he spent much of his life based in Bootle and, and, and the Northwest and, and you're down here. So uh, presumably, did you go up there or did you meet halfway or was it done online or, or on the phone? Did you meet a couple of times? What were the mechanics of of uh, getting the information that you needed. Also getting information from someone who's been in pretty horrific uh, circumstances and, and does have a, a PTSD. And, and, um, and, and we know that PTSD can sometimes distort or add complexities to memories of challenging events. So just tell me, talk, talk me through the mechanics of working with, with Joe. Yeah, so the relationship that I had with Joe was the crux of the book. Uh, I met with him um, eight times from 2016 through to early 2020, just before the lockdown took place. Most of those meetings were up in Liverpool, travelled up there to meet with him on numerous on those numerous occasions. Um, and he would he would tell me at length all about the, the details of his experiences. Uh, I'd be uh, recording our conversations uh, and, and those would be quite deep and at times emotional discussions, um, you know, where, you know, he was, he was totally open and, and, you know, transparent about what he had been through, his, his regrets, the feelings that he had, um, the, the, the anger that he still had. And I mean, at times I'd be coming away from some of those meetings with him, those those discussions, and almost be in a kind of uh, a kind of dizzying kind of haze. They were just so impactful. Um, I felt just kind of being saturated in in this other person's experiences uh, that were really deeply traumatic. I felt very powerful. So just bringing those two thoughts together, you were just saying. Or looking structuring the book there were two things you were looking to do the story yeah. the background story of joe's life and the, the incidents in the canal in 2003 um so those are the two things you're trying to do also you're trying to do that by working with joe and getting information and um so i guess you're trying to balance uh, where you know what what, what storyline you put in the what point you refer to the ptsd or what point you refer to some of these themes of justice it's quite a it, it, uh, we began by saying it's deceptively straightforward book, but actually there's these layers of complexities. I'm just interested if you can put, uh, tease out some of the themes in the book. Yes, there's, as you said, there's the themes of, of PTSD, there's the themes of accountability, responsibility of, of soldiers out in, in Iraq. And, and there was a definitely a balance that I was striving for uh, particularly when it comes to Joe and some of his memories were uh, a little foggy. So I felt it was really important to talk to as many other people as I could who were involved in what happened there in, in Iraq. So I, I didn't feel that it was going to do justice to the story by making this a you know, simple biography or me ghostwriting Joe's story. There are those books out there. Soldiers have written or co-written their own their own stories. But but for something like this, it was such a contentious uh, story. I, I wanted to to talk to as many people as I could, even even while Joe was the the kind of central subject. Right, and and that's not an easy process in itself, given that you've got soldiers across the countries uh, from different regiments, some of whom are going to be more inclined to talk than others people in different countries as well um here in, in uh, iraq and elsewhere there's not an not an easy process at all um just want to get now into some of the uh the sort of the nitty-gritty uh, of some of the detail um 
I, I know that um, when there, and I've experienced that when there are challenging incidents that you're writing about or talking about, and there's a lot involving lots of pe people, inevitably you're going to have different accounts, different sets of memories. Yeah. Um, so, for example, uh, the soldiers drive to the canal. They have the Iraqi guys with them, and um, uh, we know that for certain. We know that the Iraqi guys ended up in the water, and we know that for certain. Yeah. Uh, what we what we're less certain about is whether there was the throwing of stones, for example. So, uh, I had Hanon uh, Salim, one of the uh, key witness. Uh, I believe he talks about the, the, um, the suggestion that stones were being thrown or about to be thrown by soldiers. But but that seems uh, um, there's uh, less references to that from the soldiers themselves. So that, that seems to be doubtful. How do you pick and choose and work your way through the competing bits of evidence? It, it was a tricky thing to do to work through the different accounts. I had a lot of different sources when I was writing the book because largely, even before I started speaking to people myself, there had been investigations into these soldiers and the events that took place. So there were transcripts of interviews with the soldiers themselves where they'd given the accounts of what they said took place. So you, you had, first of all, the four soldiers who were there, uh, who drove to the water's edge with these four Iraqi looters. And then you had the account of the sole Iraqi witness who the investigators were able to find. And there were variances even between the, the, the four soldiers themselves. So, I had to find the, the commonalities between those those accounts, and in in the book, as as you know, there's I, I tell the those critical moments at the water's edge twice, once at the beginning and once towards the end, from different perspectives. Um, and again, I, I thought that was that was important an important thing to do. Um, absolutely, and so do you. So just sticking with that, the, the stone throwing as an example, yeah. well, whilst we're uh, unpicking that, um, do you feel that you come to decisions in your own mind, whether you write them down or not, and include them in the book or not, but do you feel that you come to hard and fast decisions that this did happen, but that didn't happen, you're getting different accounts and you come to decisions in your own mind about what actually happened or not? Or, or maybe not, maybe you feel, oh, you know, well, I wasn't there, I just keep an open mind about things. How, how, how do you approach some of these ambiguities? I approach the ambiguities very much with a, an open mind. It's quite a huge responsibility, I found, and, and as any author, I'm sure, would say, writing a, a non-fiction book, a responsibility to get to the, the bottom of the facts as much as possible. Um, and with with this with this story i i took into account the the things that might be biasing the the speakers so obviously the the soldiers there was some some fear uh you know about what these accusations would do to their career or what it would do to them personally there were there were changes in their in their stories in their witness testimonies uh as the investigation developed uh, the Iraqi, there were claims that he was motivated by compensation. So one could suppose that, that maybe he would make it out to be a, you know, a harsher situation than maybe it actually was. But uh, when, I mean, when you talk about the, the incident uh, with, with the, the bricks, that was critical to the uh, the Crown's prosecution during the, the court martial. The idea that the British soldiers, or at least a couple of them, had used either bricks or stones to uh, threaten the Iraqis who who had climbed into the canal, and and they'd used they'd thrown bricks at the Iraqis to usher them deeper into into the water, uh, and that was something that. Uh, had been an allegation by the Iraqi witness and which the soldiers uh, strenuously denied. Um, we'll come on to the soldiers in a bit of detail just in a moment. It's fascinating listening to you talking about the Iraqis. Just to pursue that just for the moment. So there were four that went into the water. 
there was obviously uh, Ahmed uh, Karim, who was 15, who yeah. didn't come out of the water. Uh, there was Ayed Hanon S Salim, the yep. key witness. And then there were two other guys, but they just seem to disappear, <laughs> at least from the book. It's the, they went into the water and they swim out and then that's it. Did, did, did uh, Salim not know them or be able to, f f I mean, obviously he knew them because he was with them in the first place. So, but he wasn't uh, able to find them either for the trial or for any other event. They just sort of disappeared into the night. Is, is that right? Well, even uh, Salim and uh, Hamid didn't know each other that well. Hamid being the, the boy that, uh, that, that died, that, that drowned. The, uh, the two other boys that were described by the witnesses uh, getting into the water first and, and then swimming across to um, a, a concrete uh, leg that held up the, the bridge, uh, they, they were not able to be found. Um, the RMP, the Royal Military Police investigators, uh, searched at length to try and find these two other young men, but uh, did so in vain. They weren't able to track them down. For the trial, uh, for the court martial, there were uh, a number of uh, Iraqis that, uh, that came over uh, to Colchester for the, for the court martial. Salim was, uh, was one of them. And, and, um, uh, and, and so did, did you uh, speak to any of the Iraqis um, directly at any point or, or uh, maybe it was sufficient working from the transcripts? Uh, tell me about the information you got from the Iraqi side of things. I did get in touch with uh, the Iraqis. Uh, I was able to get hold of them through uh, legal uh, representatives who were out in Iraq who had worked on the case at an earlier point. And I was able to get in touch with uh, Salim, uh, the sole witness, and also the, uh, the, the brother of the boy that, uh, that drowned. And through a, a translator, I was able to have uh, a couple of brief conversations with um, with each of them, and it was—I mean, it was just, I, again. I felt that was it was important to chat with them, to you know, allow them to have have a say. Uh, I found out, for example, from the uh, the brother of uh, Hamed that uh, uh, their their parents had subsequently uh, his, his parents had subsequently both died. Uh, his his perspective was that. Iraq was actually in a worse state after the invasion than, than it was under under Saddam, and uh, they you know they're, they're, they're still they're still struggling in in the city. So it's a quite a tour de force in the research that you did in order to put everything together. I understand why it took took, took some time to uh, to complete. Um, so moving from the Iraq is moving closer to home. It's talking about the um, the Royal Military Police, um, and, and things weren't straightforward for them either. In that um, there was the uh, uh, obviously they were in in conflict uh, themselves, caught up in conflict themselves, uh, very tough, demanding circumstances. Their their role overall isn't particularly easy because um, although they're within the army, but they're having to investigate soldiers. Um, just tell me. Uh, um, in broad terms, um, just about your the relationship uh, with the with the Royal Military Police that you developed over time. I got in touch or reached out to several of the investigators who were from the Royal Military Police, and perhaps understandably, because of the controversy that surrounded the case, they were hesitant to uh, to speak to me. I was able to talk to one former. Uh, RMP officer, um, but the, the the role of the RMP I, I found was was quite interesting because, as he said, they uh, they had experienced a pretty traumatic time in Iraq themselves. The uh, the RMP they're known as the uh, the Red Caps. There's often antagonism from soldiers towards the uh, Royal Military Police because, as you said, they're the ones that are investigating the soldiers. But when it comes to Iraq, uh, the RMP had uh, themselves been casualties of the conflict and the the growing insurgency. Uh, an example of that was. June of 2003, uh, so just a, a couple of months after uh, the the invasion, uh, there were police who 
themselves were caught up in an attack in a town that only 20 miles north of Basra, a town called Najah el Kabur. And there was uh, a, a bunch of, a mob of angry keys in the town. And the uh, uh, the, the mob just was moving through the town, angry at the, uh, the the British treatment of some of the locals, and they attacked a police station that the RMP were carrying out some some training programs with the Iraqi police, and ended up uh, with six RMP officers being killed. Um. I'll just let you know that there was a wee technical issue there. The certainly from my end, the, it okay. sounded like your, your audio just sort of dipped for a little bit, but it came back, and I think we got the gist of the, the struggles that the RMP themselves were facing. Um, and that uh, uh, so this was um, one might say a personal issue for some of the RMP members, but but um, it was hard for some of them to have a purely objective overview. That's how it struck me. Um, that was you know. that was uh, what I came away feeling from the research that I had done. Very much so. Uh, the at least one of the members of the RMP who were as involved in in the, the drowning case, he had been there as a as a witness to some of the atrocious conditions in Iraq. He had had to uh, photograph uh, a Iraqi uh, abuse victim who had been, uh, uh, he had died at the hands of a, of a British soldier, uh, an Iraqi hotelier named Bayar Musa. And so he'd had to see firsthand how some of the Iraqis had been treated by, by some British soldiers. So it did make me question both the, the, the PTSD that impacted not just the soldiers, but also the investigators, and how the, the, the scarring of the military police may have fed into the ferocity with which they investigated this case. Okay, so uh, moving to the um, Irish Guards now. Yeah. And, um, for, for most of the guys, this was uh, their first time um, in the heat of battle. Joe, in, in fact, was on the point of leaving. He, I, I, as I understand it, reading the book, he might have left or w w w wanted to leave, but was kind of persuaded to stay because uh, this was uh, there was a, a action about to happen, and they, he, he he was uh, regarded as well regarded uh, as yeah. as a as a good soldier. I think they well, wanted, like, yeah, happy go lucky kind of guy. Right, right. That's that's good to hear. And then. Uh, um, and then you can almost see it, and you're reading the book, you can almost see the unraveling, if you like, of these young guys. I, I'm, I'm guessing they're sort of, you know, well, they're not younger than 18, but they're not, many of them not older than their early 20s. And, and you can see the unraveling as they're, as they're A, sent into combat for the first time. Yeah. And then there's the uncertain conditions of urban combat. Um, and then it's very hard to know who, who's shooting from where and, and who people are. Uh, and then, and, and that's before we even get into the the tangle of the rules of engagement, which we'll, we'll come on to next. But just for them, but it just uh, was it a deliberate thing or more of a subconscious thing that you can see the the unraveling of the psychology, the unraveling of the of the of the confidence and the growth of, of PTSD um, as Joe and the guys move through their tour in Basra. Was that a conscious thing or a subconscious thing? That's uh, interesting perspective and if that's if that's a if that's a takeaway that you've you've got uh it's good to good to hear that i i, I think it was perhaps a, more of an unconscious thing i, I mean obviously i wanted to in, ensure that it was infused with this uh sense of the, the the spiral that joe was that was he was going through um you know how things were unraveling for him but uh you know, it, it's a that's an interesting perspective, Dan. Well, I think that's one of the of the successes of the book is that so you start with this guy who, like, you know, he's, he's well regarded as a soldier. He's uh, on the point of of leaving. He says they say to him, "We need you to stay on," so he does. It's quite a professional, cool, level headed decision. Yeah. And then a few months later, you cut to the guy who's losing his temper. He's getting cross. He's frustrated. He doesn't know how to handle things. It, you know, you sort of and, and you've seen this journey um, that gets you from A to B. 
And so many of these events all take place in such a small geographical space. They all take place around uh, Bridge Four and, and this bridge or this yeah. main route into the city of the southern city of Basra, where they first they first camp and they first sort of get into the city. And it's also the scene of where uh, of where, of where the, the, de the death of uh, Karim took place. So um, so you can sort of see. You, you can see sort of Joe's sort of experience sort of um, forming very quickly of, of yeah. life, of war, of, of, of action in this sort of small geographical space. And, 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 and so for you, that was more of a subconscious process in, in exploring. Yeah, that. I mean, the, the, the conscious thing that I wanted to uh, do, at least structurally, when I was writing the book is to uh, kind of almost intercut the, uh, the, the chapters from the the kind of past tense story if you like and and the present tense story uh the, the past tense including his um his experiences in training and the build up to war and the the, the actual action in iraq that the kind of more present tense is after after he comes back from iraq and the investigation and the court martial but you know i wanted to kind of you know bring out those counterpoints you know from you know him having the the optimism of of joining up to uh you know the the, the despair of, of being back and having witnessed what he had one of the causes of the difficulties for joe and, and the guys um and in fact most of the british army was the just the uncertainty, the novelty of, of, of it all. Um, you're in an urban environment in the Middle East, you know, what could possibly go wrong, wrong with that? Um, uh, but it's all okay, because it's all been governed by the Americans. And um, uh, so the, the, the complexities for, for the guys in the fields, um, is, very, is very difficult to fathom from the comfort of Hertfordshire at least. Um, so, uh, for example, the, the official ruling on managing looters, how do you arrest and manage looters if you don't have a prison or anywhere to take them to? Um, uh, to which the solution was, well, get them wet and dirty, make them uncomfortable, and they've got a long way to go home. Yeah. So, um, was that a, an official ruling? Uh, it's certainly above Joe's level. but. So how official was that ruling about how to manage looters using water? How high up do you think that went up the chain of command? The solutions that they came up with um, were very much ad hoc. And the idea of getting looters wet became known informally during the trial as, as wetting. There was no evidence I found that it was termed that while they were in Iraq, but there was, uh, 46,000 British soldiers out in Iraq during the conflict in, in 2003. And the vast majority of them were in and around the, the Basra area in, in Southern Iraq, but none of them necessarily had anticipated the, uh, the breakdown of society. Uh, it happened in, in Baghdad, and it happened in Basra and, and other places as well, that once uh, the initial jubilation uh, at the fall of, of Saddam um, had kind of faded away, there was, there was very quickly this breakdown of, of society and, and mass looting spreading, um, you know, across all aspects of uh, the, the city, uh, you know, from uh, you know, beds take being ripped out of ICU units to copper being torn out of cables that were strung up around the city, uh, tiles being ripped up, e everywhere stuff was being looted. And there, because of um, that, that, that breakdown not being anticipated, there was no plan for how they would deal with it. Uh, so it just ended up being a case of get them wet or dislocate the kind of take them fr away from a particular area, get them wet, dry them out of town, uh, make them walk home. It, it was said that uh, during, during one of the trials, during the court martial, they were slightly trying to play on this um, uh, Iraqi sense of, sense of pride that if a, a, a looter returned home in, at night sopping wet, then, you know, that might embarrass them and, and deter them from, from doing it again. But uh, it was, 
it, it was not something that was well thought through or, or anyone really expected that there would be a detrimental outcome to it. So um, you're clear in your mind that when the four guys were in the, in the warrior, when Sergeant Carl Selman says, right, we're at the hospital, but we've got to get in the warrior, we've got these looters, we're going to take them off. Uh, that there wasn't, a, there's not a feeling amongst the four guys in the warrior, talking, the four Brits talking amongst themselves about the four Iraqis who were also in the same armoured vehicle sitting next to them. Yeah. There's, not a, there's not a chat saying, well, uh, we really don't like these guys. It's a personal thing amongst us. We're going to take them to the canal and, and, and we won't tell anybody else about it. That's what we're going to do. It wasn't so much like that. It was more of a, that's what you do in this company and in this in, 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 in this battalion, that, that seems to be the instruction coming down from above. Is that your take on it? That was something that came up quite extensively in the, the court martial trial. Uh, why was it that these four looters were taken to this particular spot, which is, you know, 15 minutes or so drive away from uh, the hospital where they were apprehended? Why take them so far out of town? Uh, Carl Selman, his contention uh, was that it was somewhere that they were familiar with. There had been a checkpoint there at an earlier point during the uh, during the war. Uh, it, it was a, a familiar familiar point, but the soldiers themselves, they who were inside the inside the the warrior armored vehicle, I, I, I believe them that they they didn't have a clear intention or awareness of, of where they were going. Joe said uh, many times when he'd been in the back of the warrior, he was following orders, even when he was going out on uh, QRF, quick reaction force um, deployments, he'd just be told to get into the into the vehicle, they would go somewhere, he would get out, he wouldn't know, wouldn't be told where they were going. And that was that was the same situation here. Uh, the Carl Selman told the driver to, to drive, um, and they drove to Bridge Four, but I, I, I don't think that there was the, the forethought or intentionality. This was, remember, this was towards the end of their tour. Uh, one of the tragic things about the, uh, the, the death was that this was on the, the very day before they were all due to leave Basra. And they had actually been told the, uh, the the previous night, just you know, basically everyone uh, keep it together, you know, keep you know, keep your hands clean, just uh, uh, you know, no no unnecessary risks. And then this sadly this this happened. We were talking earlier about some of the uncertainties, the fog of war, if you like, and the yeah. anomalies. You talk to four different people, you get four different accounts of what what happened. Um, but even in individuals sort of seem to veer back and forth as to what their thinking was. So uh, Carl Selman, the sergeant in, in command of the warrior, is at the water's edge. Uh, he stays in the vehicle uh, and then there are three guys who get off the vehicle and take the looters down to the water. And Joe is one of those. Yeah. And, and Selman at one point says, uh, oh, so the, the, the Iraqis go in the water and um, two of them swim over. Um, Selim then starts going and, and uh, um, Hamid, uh, Ahmed Kareem obviously doesn't make it. And, and, um, and Selman can see this. Selman can see what's happening with Kareem at one point. He can see, he, so he shouts down to the three guys by the water's edge. And he says, if he doesn't come back up, you've got to go in and get him. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's also Selman who's the one who says, right, right, we've all got to go now. And um, so it seems there's a bit of personal conflict back and forth with, with Selman and maybe that's, a, a consequence of radio messages coming in just and and, and then and then the final part of that little equation um is that one of the soldiers who's, who happened to be the driver james cook uh, he then listens to selman and starts taking his webbing off and the rest of it in order to get into the water yeah um, well, well we'll come on to joe's reaction what he what he was doing um but but just tell me a bit about that that's another anomaly a bit of uncertainty are they helping the guy or are they leaving that i mean that is very much a key critical moment is that that point where do they decide to help someone or not? Do they recognize that he's in trouble? Do the, the soldiers just want to, to get out of there as, as quickly as they can? 
obviously they the soldiers at, at one point recognize that uh Hamad Karim is in difficulty he's he's in the water um they they see him go down he's 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 struggling and James Cook uh Lance Corporal uh who was the driver he he starts to um get undressed to climb in the water and and and, and try and rescue this this kid and that's you know that's that's not that's not what ends up happening um they they get a signal from uh selman the uh the, the sergeant that they have to to mount up and they 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 leave what does joe say about that moment does he, what does he say about the, the conflict in his mind i i, I heard someone i thought i oh, better go and help him or maybe he says oh, i didn't hear someone I, I i wasn't thinking about helping him i was thinking about listening to someone and getting back on what, what what's joe's take on that moment obviously that's i i found that was the trickiest area to talk with joe about personally because that's that, that's always the the point that he comes back to you as as uh, something that he genuinely says that he felt a lot of guilt about, because that's again that's that's when you know someone decides whether or not to to help someone who's in need. And Joe said to me, you know, when we, we went over it multiple times um, from from different different perspectives, but but his. Uh, what he said to me was that he was he was following orders. He saw Selman making this hand signal, which Joe interpreted as uh, mount up double time. And Joe didn't know whether there was uh, a critical incident taking place back at the uh, hospital where they had been stationed, whether the rest of their uh, fellow uh, soldiers in their section were in, in some kind of danger, some kind of trouble. Uh, Joe didn't know that, so that was what was going through his mind. So he made that decision that he had to get back into the Warrior Armoured Vehicle, and, and he was the senior guardsman on the ground. So he essentially was responsible for uh, Martin McGing and also James Cook, uh, but, you know, for them getting, you know, leaving, leaving that area. But, you know, Joe... Joe has, has, has always always said that you know he keeps coming back to that moment and, and, and deeply regrets it. Um, I know I noticed from the book as well that it's 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 uh, perhaps um, not the moment itself that causes the greatest difficulty with the recurring dreams for Joe in later weeks and months and years what really stirs that difficulty for joe it seems to me is is when he's arrested uh by the uh, by the royal military police we were talking about earlier and 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 they are quite emphatic if you like about their take on on things and and in the in their choice of words for joe and and what he according to them what he did and what he should feel guilty about. It's that that seems to trigger the dreams. Is, is, is that uh, fair? Is that true? I think that's true. I think Joe had definitely been impacted by the events in, in Iraq uh, in, in, a, in a very grievous manner. Before the investigation took place, it weighed very heavily on him. I, I, I could sense that from what he told me, he'd been desensitized uh, by, by some of the events, but really when the investigation began, when the Royal Military Police started their uh, interviewing of him, that's really when, uh, when, when Joe says the nightmares came back, when, when those memories were really dra dragged up to the surface and his his struggle you know really really kind of hit of course so then he's got this um th th this sort of twin track cause of of diff of emotional difficulty if you like you've got the yeah. incident itself and then you've got the ongoing court case the court martial and i think it took three years it did uh, yes. for uh, it to come about what just remind me why it took so long 
I mean, the, there were a couple of different reasons why it took some time from the investigation beginning and, and the court martial. One of the reasons was because the investigators struggled in, in the process of them investigating the, the soldiers themselves. Uh, it took some time for them to, to track down who was actually responsible with that many with thousands of soldiers there. It was no easy task for the, the RMP to track down who it was. Then once they had narrowed down which company it was, which platoon, which section, then, then they started talking to uh, the, the, the soldiers. Now in, in that section, there was about eight, uh, eight men. So they had to try and determine you know, if they were involved, uh, if they, what responsibility they had. Initially, there was, um, there was some denial by the soldiers themselves. And eventually the RMP once had kind of pieced the, the, the case together and, and they've made their arrests and done their, their interviews. Uh, the, the case was then passed over to uh, the, the Crown Prosecution Service and they had to uh, determine the likelihood of getting a, a conviction and if it was in public interest to do that. And, and by that point, um, it was you know, almost two years uh, from when the events took place. Um, and then they, they set a court date and it's almost 15, it was actually it was 15 years ago uh, to now that the court case took place, the court martial in, uh, uh, in, in Colchester. Wow, right, okay. And uh, as to the outcome and how it happened and how things unfolded and what took place, maybe we can invite people to buy the book and find out. Indeed, um, don't spoil the ending. Don't spoil the ending, yeah, but um, how's Joe today? And, and, and has, has he read the book or have you, have you discussed the book with him? How, uh, tell us about uh, Joe uh, as he is right now. Yeah, I, I spoke to Joe today, in fact. Uh, he, uh, he's, he was, he's nervous about the, the book, but excited. It's something that, I, I, as I said, I, I, I wrote involving uh, uh, a multitude of, of perspectives and, and, and people that I spoke to. It wasn't a, a book that I, I wrote and, and had Joe have editorial control or, or, or sign off on it, though I did show him, uh, you know, the first half of the book when it was in an in a early draft stage. Um, and he, he looked at that, only had like a, a, few, a few comments um, and obviously went back to him, you know, to, to kind of fact check some stuff. But uh, and I, I sent him, he received actually a copy of the, the, the book today and, and his word, in his words, he was made up, super excited um, in, his, in his kind of, uh, you know, scouser, happy-go-lucky kind of way. Uh, um, but I mean, I, I can tell that, um, you know, he's, he's still, he still struggles, um, that the, the events, they still cast this, uh, this, this shadow over him. There, you know, there, there are some some soldiers who uh, go through similar things and, and you know kind of able to find a maybe more redemptive end to their their story. Uh, but Joe, I, I sense it, you know, is, is, is still is still struggling because even after the court martial, there were the the multiple investigations that you know that hounded him uh, for, for for numerous years. So it's, it's it's a difficult thing for him to to get over. I know he said that he still has nightmares about what took place in Iraq. No, I'm I'm, I'm sure difficult to to imagine those of us who who weren't there and didn't go through what he did. Um, so uh, I think maybe for a couple of minutes, why don't we talk about uh, the uh, wider issues about um, uh, the the timeliness of the book, if if you like. I'm just thinking about the overseas operations. Bill, um, thinking about uh, Johnny Mercer, who recently quit as veterans minister. Why don't we talk about talk around some of those things for a couple of minutes, uh, and then if anybody has questions, we can uh, come to the audience and, and take questions in the uh, in the uh, written questions in the Q and A box there, uh, and uh, move to those in a moment. But but for now, yeah, just tell me. Um, I mean, there's a lot going on right now. Even today, we discovered, well, you, you, you discovered and, and let me know about a, a film uh, about Phil Shiner. Just remind us who Phil Shiner is. Yes, film, Phil Shiner is, uh, or, or was, a, uh, uh, a lawyer 
and he was behind a company called Poli um, Public Interest Lawyers. And they were uh, a company that was key in, in bringing forth a lot of cases from Iraq that were accusations and, and allegations against British soldiers. Uh, and it was subsequently found out that uh, Phil Shiner um, was not acting in a, in a honorable way. He was using uh, financial rewards to the, uh, the people in, in Iraq who were finding cases for him, his, his legal uh, assistance in Iraq. Um, and, and that contravened uh, obviously ethical rules, but legal rules as well. And he was eventually um, struck off as a, as a solicitor and uh, his, his company closed down. But the, uh, yeah, there's a, a new film that uh, BBC will be showing next month uh, called Danny Boy and uh, stars uh, Toby Jones as uh, Phil Shiner. And it, it tells the story of uh, an attack that took place uh, in May of 2004 at uh, uh, a place uh, which was a checkpoint known as Danny Boy and uh, a bunch of Iraqis ambushed some soldiers from uh, uh, the, the Prince of Wales Royal Regiment and uh, it was it was the first bayonet charge that had taken place for uh, well over 30 years and it was quite a brutal encounter and it resulted in accusations that the uh, that the British had uh, tortured and uh, mutilated Iraqi bodies. Um, it, it turned out that after a, a, again a, a court case, uh, the El Swedi uh, inquiry uh, a number of years ago, that uh, these these allegations were mostly unfounded. But uh, this, this again, this this film shows that these uh, these issues are still being being wrestled with. And again, issues of the culpability, the accountability of uh, soldiers themselves is, is, is constantly being discussed today. Uh, there have been two uh, British soldiers uh, who are pensioners now are being investigated in Ireland over killings dating back to the 1970s. And that's something that the uh, Overseas Operations Bill has been trying to, trying to limit. Okay, well, we'll keep talking about that. If, uh, if anybody does have a question, feel free to write it down and send it in and um, we, uh, I, I, I will ask Will. Um, but for the moment, uh, we'll keep going. Um, so you were just talking about the Overseas Operations Bill and, um, uh, and of course the, uh, the Veterans Minister in, in, in charge of that, um, who was over involved in that, um, quit Johnny recently, Johnny Mercer, yeah. So just remind us a bit about the bill and why he quit. One of the one of the, the bills, one of the pieces of legislation that uh, Johnny Mercer, as uh, the Veterans Minister, really got behind, was this um, Overseas Operations Bill. And one of the things that that he wanted to do was uh, um, to to have the bill prevent what was described as uh, vexatious claims and allegations against British soldiers. Uh, on, on the other on the other side of the coin, uh, there were there were uh, accusations that this bill um, would prevent uh, those soldiers accused of war crimes from being fully investigated. Again, from the, the soldiers' perspective, the the aim was to to have a, a bill that would limit claims against them. So if there were uh, spurious claims, then there would be some statute of limitation on, uh, on, on those claims against them. And, and again, Joe is, is, is someone who, because of the, 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 the claims that have come against the, the soldiers, even after his, his court-martial and, and after, he, after that took place, he found himself you know, being investigated again and again. So, uh, and I, so I think that, uh, and, and because of that, he, he's involved in, in an ongoing claim now, I, I, I think, is, 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 is that right? Yeah, I mean, he, he's hoping that uh, there will be some way that he can get, um, 
you know, at, at least, you know, some acknowledgement of what he, he went through. One of the key struggles that he had, particularly during that period when he was waiting for the, the court martial date, was he, he reached out to uh, the MOD, reached out to the army, his employers, and, 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 and said that he was struggling. His, his mum reached out to them and he never felt like he got support. Um, and, and you have to remember back, uh, you know, 15, 16 years ago, this was before, you know, combat stress and help for heroes and, and these other uh, great charities that, that now recognize uh, PTSD and, and try and help soldiers. But, you know, right after the two or three years after the Iraq war, those groups didn't exist. And so, you know, that was the, the core of, of the struggle. And, and, and Joe, I think, just wants some, you know, wants some kind of acknowledgement, some apology, some, you know, response, as, as many other soldiers do, of, 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 that, of that struggle. Well, so this has been a long journey for you, as we were saying in the beginning, five years now. What, just uh, tell me one or two moments for you, a, a moment of discovery, perhaps, where you were able to give some fresh information into the process or, or a moment of, uncertainty, you know, uh, trying to, dealing with these big images, uh, big themes like PTSD, quite difficult. And just tell me one or two uh, key moments for you during this process. I think some, a couple of key moments for me with writing this book was fr from the, just the, the writing process for me was just the, the, the connecting with, with with Joe and actually with, with the other soldiers. It was something that I, you know, I found the, the most enjoyable, most rewarding part of this was just talking to soldiers, you know, these, these you know, hardened, you know, battle weary guys, but hearing the, the, the deep, like the, the, the deep stories that they, that they shared with me often through, through tears. Um, you could tell that, you know, often they, they just maybe wanted someone to, to share and uh, to share with, and, and it was maybe a cathartic process. So, you know, that was, that was something. And then I felt like everyone gave me, you know, a, a new nugget of information, whether it was the extent to which the, you know, looting had taken place or what motivated that or all aspects like that. Did you talk to Lynn, to uh, Joe, Joe's mum? I did, yeah. I, I, I met her and then I, I chatted to her by phone and she was a, a she's a, a lovely lady. Yeah, she's a, a tower of strength. She is a really warm personality. She supported Joe throughout the investigation. Um, she, she loves her, her kids a, a huge amount and you can tell that, she, you know, she she felt every ounce of the struggle that he was he was going through. Okay, so here's a question that's come from uh, Joe Brooks. Uh, Joe, thank you for your question. Uh, Joe says, uh, hi, well, congratulations on your book. Uh, looking forward to reading it over the coming days. What were the most difficult aspects of uh, putting this book together? Yeah, uh, thanks, Joe, that's a, a great question. I think, I think that the most difficult parts of it were actually almost emotionally grueling. It was, sitting down and immersing myself in Joe's experiences. And uh, as I said earlier, I'd, I'd, um, he'd allowed me to uh, record our conversations. So I, I, I was kind of, you know, playing those back, getting myself in, in the headspace to write as, as, as vividly as I could to convey to readers what he had gone through. And, you know, although I, I've, I'm not a soldier. I've I've never been to war. At the same time, it was there was just something so heartbreaking about getting in that in that headspace of, uh, of of trying to write what everything that he had been through, and I, I found that quite a, a draining and and, and grueling process. Uh, what what do you have in mind for next? I know that you divide your time between writing and TV, um, but what about future projects? Yeah, uh, right now I'm I'm working on a uh, a, a TV project. Um, it's a, a true crime series for a, a US network. 
Um, but otherwise, uh, outside of TV, uh, I've got a script that uh, I'm working on at the moment. And there's uh, an another book that I've not started work on, but um, I've, uh, I've, I've got an idea in mind. It's related to the, uh, the war on terror and deals with ideas of, of, of truth and belief. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a subject that I'm, I'm passionate about. And I think that's, you know, that, that's key if you're going to engage in, in the, the, the long run marathon that is writing a book. Well, well, big congratulations to you. Thank Brilliant you, to talk to you. Uh, I'm going to hand you back to, uh, to Ben, but uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Don't go anywhere, Dan. Don't go anywhere. That's, um, what a fascinating um, uh, conversation you've had. It's been, uh, it's been very, very interesting. Um, we've only got, we've got three or four minutes left. I was actually going to more focus on the, um, the, the publishing process and the uh, will I mean obviously I, I, I know a little more about that than, than I do that your your subject but w was it difficult getting getting a publisher to, to, to get on board with your book we, how, how was that process it, it was a it was somewhat of a, a tricky process um, it's it, it's it's perhaps not a you know a massively popular subject it's it's perhaps a wrestles with some some difficult issues. But again, at the same time, as I said earlier, I felt like it was an important story to find a way to, to get out there. And uh, it was, I think a couple of breakthroughs were, were when I, I found an agent, uh, lovely people at WGM, um, and they, they kind of started taking the, uh, uh, the book out to uh, some, some publishing companies. And uh, obviously once you've got a, an agent, it does open up the, the doors. Right. Um, but it's uh, been great to work with Pen and Sword Books, who's uh, a major publisher of history and military titles. And uh, they've been a great team to work with. Fantastic. Yeah, I did wonder whether you would allude to, uh, you know, that, that the email you got where uh, suddenly you've got an offer to, uh, to to actually publish the book. That that that's the kind of thing I think Dan was inferring. I think in terms of highlights of your uh, the last four years. And can you remember that day, that morning, that email when it dropped? And I mean, I think it was it, it did it did happen um, last last late last spring. Um, but the fact that it happened during lockdown and last year, 2020, is like a bit of a blur. Uh, I can't pinpoint the exact day that that, that came through, but uh, I'm, wow. I'm real, uh, real grateful to be at that point now where it's the book's published, the book's out there. So it's uh, an exciting moment. Yes, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen it in our shop window. I, I, I suspect you have, have you? Um, I, I think, yeah, I think I briefly saw it yesterday when I was, I was going by. So uh, it was a great moment. God, where's my copy? Oh, I left it over there. Never mind. But listen, we're, um, we have to bring all good things to an end. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you thank to you. Uh, the lovely audience. Uh, Dan, thank you for your time. Now, Dan, you've got uh, your own little project you're working on. What, uh, what's that? <laughs> oh, well, uh, so um, I'm writing, I've, I've published um a few things before, uh, but never fiction. And I'm currently working on uh, my first novel. And um, so I'm not far off finishing that. And hopefully we might come back here another day when the boot will be on the other foot. But uh, I guess I have to finish it first. Well, look Can you give us any, any clues about this? Uh, I worked on uh, an Australian cattle station uh, uh, and the story starts there uh, and I was about 100 years younger than I am now and I wasn't allowed to touch anything because of the murder of two boys that had happened the year before I'd got there. They were the same age as me and um, so it was an investigation into what happened to them and, and the story starts there. But it's sort of uh, uh, semi-autobiographical and it ends up with um, me uh, spending a year uh, tracking down Neil Armstrong and I've become the first person to get a TV interview with Neil Armstrong. Brilliant, brilliant. Good. So th listen, everyone, thank you for your time. Um, we've got, uh, we've had a load of um, virtual events. We'll be putting them on our YouTube channel. Um, we'll be put putting this one on our YouTube channel in the next day or two. I'll just quickly paste that into the chat function so uh, you can always just grab it there. And um, We've got a series of events coming up over the coming week. Um, I'm trying to think what would interest you all. Um, on Tuesday, Maggie Shipstead doing a great circle. Uh, a children's event on Thursday, probably not relevant. However, Dave Goulson, gardening for bumblebees. We've got to be all interested in that, um, which is next week. 
Um, and then Emma John, she's another local author, actually, who um, we're doing a memoir of a, a lifelong single. Um, so, and then uh, James Canton, I think I'm, I'm skirting through a number of other events. The Oak Papers, that's coming up uh, at the beginning of June. But uh, booking thick and fast the whole time, honestly. Uh, my, my, uh, my, my year-long lockdown can be seen by looking at the YouTube channel as to how many events we've done. So it's been... It's been a joy to host you guys. Will, congratulations on the on Thank the on, on publishing your book. Dan, good luck with getting your one done. Thank and uh, an audience, thank you so much for spending the last hour with us. So uh, uh, we'll see you for another event very soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>